find our seats, please. Would you stand with us this morning? There's nothing impossible for you. When all I see is the flashes, you see the beauty. When all I see is the cross, God, you see the empty tomb. battle belongs to you and every fear I lay at your feet I'll sing through the night oh God the battle belongs to you sing an almighty fortress an almighty fortress you go before us Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. An almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Oh. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees. With my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet. I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Amen. Good morning, Quest family. How are you this morning? Good. Did you guys have fun last night at trivia? Yeah. Awesome. All right. In James 1, verse 17, it says, Every good and perfect gift from above is coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. And I just thought that was important to hear this morning. Um, there's so much chaos in our lives. There's so much chaos in the world. There's so much that we're pursuing. And yet our heavenly Father is the giver of those gifts that we have whether it's our job or successes or things that we just need to have provided for us. 
He does not change like shifting shadows. So from day in to day out, month in, month out, year in to year out, we praise a heavenly father that takes care of us and sends those gifts down to us. And so this morning, praise him for those things. Praise him for whatever it is in your life that he's doing for you. We're going to sing.
will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath. Good morning. Welcome to Quest. We are so glad to have you all here this morning. If you're tuning in online, welcome. If you are new this morning, we want to welcome you. We're so glad you're here. And if you're not as new, if you've been here many, many, many years, uh, as far back as you can remember, we are glad you're here too this morning to connect with God, uh, to worship. And one thing we say a lot about uh, at Quest, part of our mission is to seek God, love people, engage life, and find hope. And uh, we're really glad to have you here this morning to seek God wherever you're coming at in your spiritual journey and in your walk with God, uh, what you believe. We're so glad to have you here, whether you're skeptical, you're asking questions, you're inquiring, or you're totally convinced. Uh, we're really glad to have you here. And to love people, to really warmly, intentionally care and love uh, each other, and also to engage life, to deal with the good things and the bad things, the bad things like that summer is coming, like already. The, I don't know. I'm, I like spring. It's going, coming too fast. Uh, but in all seriousness, the, there's really great things in life, and there's also really hard things. And so we need a community of people to walk with us through that and to find hope in the midst of that. Uh, not just a wishful thinking hope, but an assurance of God's goodness and his intentional care in our life uh, to bring new things in the midst of the brokenness. So we're really glad to have you here to join us on that mission to seek God, love people, engage life, and find hope. And I just want to take a real quick moment to say thank you to you all and to uh, do a brief recap. Last night, we had our trivia night event right here. Woo! You got Earlier, um, Luke said, are you guys excited? Are you we're, who was here for trivia last night? And it was kind of like, eh. It's because you had so much fun. You're just like, you're, you need that coffee to kick in a little bit more. It was an amazing night. It was so fun. We had challenging trivia. I mean, honestly, I was like, I was not, if I was at anyone's table, I was not helping on the, on the questions, even if I wanted to help. Uh, great questions, a lot of fun, great food. You guys brought so much great food. Uh, but what, for me, it was, it was just unbelievable. So uh, it was so fun. But we also, the funds that came in to support, uh, go to our student ministry, particularly our summer camp with King's Kids Camp and our uh, high school conference going to challenge a youth conference this summer. Your generosity, I don't even have words to say. And we're in the process still of calculating what you all gave, but it's, it feels like standing on holy ground. It's just unbelievable. Your heart for students to invest in them as they're trying to seek God and engage life and find hope, because it's a crazy world that they're trying to sort through those questions of who am I and where do I fit and what's my purpose? And so you are all a part of that. And we just wanted to say thank you so, so much from the deepest parts of our hearts, from student ministry, church leadership. And thank you also to all of you who are involved, whether it was uh, in raising up items for the silent auction, to pulling the event together, volunteering in every way. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of hands involved in this. So thank you to you all and thank you all for coming. Now, uh, I do think we have to address this. I, there was, um, I had probably conversations about 80 of you last night who were upset about some trivia. <laughs> Don't laugh, this is a serious deal, okay. <laughs> That's how you know it's not serious, okay. But you guys, you were upset that there was not questions about the Gospel of Matthew in the trivia, right? 
I, okay, I didn't have actual conversations with the eighty of you, but you said it in your eyes. You, you said, I would have crushed it if Matthew was the, the but it, it wasn't. So, um, yeah, okay. Uh, we, we have a lot of fun stuff coming up. You, we have the skinny to give you the skinny on the stuff coming up. So check it out, and uh, you can sign up for stuff over at the ministry table later. Check out the skinny. Thanks, Jonathan, and good morning, Quest. It's that time of the morning to listen up, because here's the skinny. Our young families and Quest Kids teachers are gathering at Wildwood Community Park after service on Sunday, May 5th. It's Cinco de Mayo that day, so there will be a taco bar for everyone to enjoy, plus maybe a few other surprises. Be sure to RSVP at the ministry table or at the Quest Kids check-in desk by Sunday, April 28th. The Women's Book Club had a blast this past week discussing their latest read. The next one will be in July, so ladies, if you're interested, be sure to grab a bookmark at the ministry table for the upcoming book club dates. While Kevin's on his working sabbatical at the end of April and the first half of May, he will be hosting prayer meetings here at Quest. Tuesday morning, starting April 23rd, the building will be open for prayer from 6.30 to 8 a.m. Then Thursdays, there will be time for prayer between 6 and 7 p.m. with prayer with the elders available on April 25th and May 9th. Quest Students is our youth group for students that are 6th through 12th grades. They meet on Wednesday nights from 6.30 to 8.30. The schedule sometimes changes for special events, so be sure to check out our socials for any updates to the schedule. You can also talk to Jonathan Walker to get on the email list for Quest students so you don't miss out on any important announcements pertaining to Quest's youth group. Also, do you get our weekly newsletters? They're really helpful to get all of our upcoming events and announcements straight into your inbox. Along with finding all the event signups, you can get on the email list over at the ministry table, or you can sign up on our website, which you will find at questchurchstl.org. If you can't tell, we really want to make sure that you know what's going on here at Quest, so you don't miss out on any opportunities for connection and growth, spiritually and relationally. Now that the announcements are done, please welcome Kevin to the stage. That's the fastest I've run in a long time. <laughs> Hey, you guys, we're, we're doing really good on time, so I always like to throw in a meet and greet if we can, even though this morning we are going to do communion, which takes a little bit more time at the end of the service. So prepare yourself for communion. There are three stations, one here, one there, one in the back corner, and for you gluten-free, there's one up here in the, on the table. Uh, so uh, prepare yourself, because the Lord tells us to not take communion unworthily. So if you're not a believer here this morning, obviously you're welcome here. But if you haven't given your life to Christ, that would just be kind of an act of religiosity, and we would never want you to do that. Uh, also, if you're kind of at war with God right now, you know, I don't know if you've ever been there, but I think we've probably all been there at times, or you're really out of sorts, or really living in an undealt with sin in your life, he tells, tells us not to take it unworthily. So if you're in that place, I'd say just skip it this morning, and then in a week or two or three or four, whenever you were kind of ready, it's a time to come back, okay? But between now and then, you're going to meet some really wonderful people because just so you know, I'm going to ask you to meet someone, just say hello. And just so you know, who you're going to meet was made in the image of God himself. Nothing else in all of creation was made in the image of God except for human beings. So you're going to say hello to someone, and you go, oh my gosh, there is God's handiwork. The ability to love, the ability to be creative, the, the, the ability to think. This is all given to you then it reflects who God is like. So you're just going to meet a reflection of the image of God in a second. That's pretty heavy, right? Now, they're, they're dressed in some strange look sometimes, you know, but, uh, but it'll be a great experience. So you've got exactly a minute and a half to experience the image of God. Ready? Go. <laughs>
All right, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. All right. All right, here we go. Here we roll. Yeah, this is your fault. This is your fault. It is. All right, here we go. All right. Here we go. All right. Hey, uh, you guys, uh, I know we said last week, or we kind of insinuated that that would be our last week in Matthew, uh, and it was a semi-lie, uh, just so you know. Um, but uh, we are going to start a new series next week, and we'll tell you about that at the end of what I'm going to share this morning. But we are going to go back into Matthew. Uh, and I just want to say, uh, this is called uh, a handbook for discipleship. What does it look like to be a follower of Christ? Now, I just want to tell you, several weeks ago, I was in a meeting with a bunch of pastors. Uh, and you ought to come. Those are very unique experiences. Um, but uh, in, a, in a meeting with a bunch of them, and it was just so happened we were sharing different things, kind of what was going on, what you're excited about, what was going, kind of taking up your time. And one young guy uh, that's doing a really cool church in St. Charles, he said, hey, I'm working on a discipleship curriculum. And I'm really excited about it. I've been really working on it. And I'm thinking, okay, that's, that's cool. And then another guy who is more uh, middle age ish, he's probably in his 40s, uh, you know, he was saying in his church, uh, they were working on, he was working on a discipleship cu curriculum. And I thought, oh, so I had three responses in my head, in my heart. Uh, but my first one was, like, hey, that's really cool. These guys are working on it. This is meaningful to them. This is really core to the, to the church. Um, so that's really cool. Then my second thought was, well, that's cool, but why don't just one of you do it uh, and then the other one just use it, right? I mean, it'd be a bit more efficient time usage if one of them finished theirs and just shared it with the other guy. And my third thought was, uh, you guys are absolute idiots. What are you doing? It's already been done for us. The Gospel of Matthew is a handbook for discipleship. You don't need to develop your own. It's here already. Now, I did reserve myself from saying that. Uh, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't say it, but I wanted to. Like, are you kidding me? Uh, but uh, Matthew is a handbook for discipleship. Look at this. In Matthew 28, and I think this is kind of the meaning, the, the, the purpose behind Matthew. It says this. Uh, this is after the resurrection. This is before his ascension. He meets his men in Galilee. In fact, it says, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee. Remember, they were minus Judas because he had betrayed Jesus and he was so taken over by that that he killed himself. Um, but he says that the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted like humans do. And Jesus said, came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples. Circle that. This is why he wrote this book. He wrote this whole thing from a somewhat Jewish mindset. He's writing to Hebrews. Uh, he, because he, he gives a genealogy in the first part of the book. Uh, but he is writing to them and he says, I want you to go and I want you to make disciples of all nations. Circle that of everyone in the entire world. That's what I want you to do. Now, you guys, this is why we existed as, as a church too. Here's our purpose statement. If you look in our constitution, uh, and this is really, this is our purpose statement as a church, is to do this. It is to glorify God by making disciples. Now, that's not the only thing we do to glorify God, but one of the things we do to glorify him is to help people be followers of Jesus. Now, here are the four qualifications. Who know God personally and worship him sincerely, who apply biblical truth to daily living, who generously share their lives and resources with their brothers and sisters in Christ, and who are burdened and equipped to reach the world for Christ. That's why we exist. That's our purpose statement. Now, we have a little motto or mantra or a little way we say it to make it a little shorter. We say it this way, that we want to be a people and a place where the skeptic, the one who's saying, I'm not really buying this. I may be here, but I'm not buying what you're selling. 
uh, a skeptic or an inquirer, someone who says, hey, I want to consider buying what you're saying. I'm trying to wrestle with the issues of life. I am, I am inquiring about what it's all about. Or to be the already convinced. There's people who say, I've thought it through. I've wrestled with it. I'm convinced. I've given my life to it. I've decided to put faith in that which is reasonable and rational and understandable. And that we can together find room. That there's room here for you. There's a place where you can be. There's a place where you can be with all of your, your confidence and with all of your doubts. That there's room here for every person. That there's room and reason to belong, to believe, and to be transformed. That's what we're all about. So, now, you guys, the other Gospels have purposes for them, too. They all record the life of Jesus, right? Uh, but they, there's different kind of an angle on each of it. In Mark, uh, Mark probably was written to a Roman mindset. The book Gospel of Mark is shorter. Uh, it's more action-packed. Uh, and Jesus is, re- is presented not only as Messiah, but he's presented as king. That will speak to a Roman mindset, right? They understood kingness, emperorness, emperorness, that, well, I don't know what that word is, but being an emperor, right? They got that. Look at it in verse 10, uh, verse, chapter 10. It says, but whoever would be great among you, so he relates who's going to be great among you, Jesus says, must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. See, the king is the one who's a suffering servant in the eyes of Mark and what Jesus said. And he brings that out so that the Romans understood that. Uh, Luke was written to a Greek mindset, right? And so Luke in chapter 1, uh, and Luke got most, probably most of his information because he was a Greek. He wasn't one of the disciples, but probably from his relationship with the Apostle Paul. And he says this, to a Greek mindset, inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things that have been taught. Luke wanted to outline it chronologically and very clearly what, what happened. That's the way a Greek mindset would think. That's the purpose of him writing the life of Jesus for the Greeks. And, and John probably looks like he wrote to a very generalist or an everyone mindset. But the purpose of the book, the way he wrote it, the purpose of it is this. Look at verse uh, 30 of chapter 20. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. This isn't uh, everything. This is just some. But the things that I have written, he says, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. You see, John wrote his gospel for belief. So a lot of times when you meet someone who, who's either new to Christ or is considering Christ, if you're a skeptic or an inquirer, I would inc- encourage you, read the gospel of John. The purpose of the book is that you might come to faith and come to belief. And it's not a mass, mystical, magical thing, but it is somehow that God uses that gospel because that's the reason it was written. It's for you to come to belief. But Matthew, let's go on, was to, to make disciples of all nations. That's why he wrote this. And look at this in verse 20. Highlight it in yellow. Teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And he outlines what it is that Jesus taught. Now, let's go real quickly. You've seen this chart in a little bit different form. But the Gospel of Matthew is six segments of narrative interspersed with five sections of teaching. Narrative just being the story of all the events. And then there's these teaching sections. And, and there, that's the way it's organized so that we understand what did Jesus teach us to obey, right? Now, you guys, just for a second, I want to just do the six, six segments of narrative. I'm not going to spend much time on it today. But the first four chapters are the kingdom begins. We, we find there the fact that he is the, the son of David, the son of Abraham. It's deep into Hebrew history. And that's where Jesus came from. And he says that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's what John the Baptist says, and later Jesus says it too. The kingdom of heaven has come. 
The second, uh, eight through nine, is the fact that it's kingdom authority, or in other words, the dynamic evidence that Jesus is the Messiah, all these activities that he's doing. People start to go, oh my gosh, this is something incredible. Then in chapters uh, 11 through 12, Jesus reveals his identity. And his, his identity, uh, and that many are in opposition to him. The opposition raises up early in his ministry, and they start pushing back. And then in the chapters 14 through 17, the kingdom is intensified. And as he pushes more and more, they push back more and more, and they begin to, for the very first time, say, he needs to be killed. And that begins, the ball begins to roll over the next year or so, preparing for his death. And then the section on 19 through 22, kingdom design, kingdom conflict. They're critically important last minute instructions that Jesus gives. And then the last one is kingdom finished. It is the pain of the cross and the glory of the resurrection. Now, those are the narrative sections. What I want to do right now is talk a little bit about the five sections of teaching. Okay, and I want to take a look at it from kind of a 10,000 foot level. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to try to communicate this better because if I need to stand on my head to communicate so I can teach, then I'll do it. Now, I'm not going to do that this morning, but I'm going to move myself around a little bit. But here's what I want you to think about as I almost trip off today. If this is a handbook for discipleship, then it's a handbook for you if you're a believer to think through why did Jesus say the things he said and the way he said it, and why did Matthew record it in the way he did? If, as one of the disciples, he wanted us to know what it meant to be a follower of Jesus, then why did he record it in this way? How do you apply it, think it through, wrestle with it? In fact, he's just recording the three years. Now remember, all this took place over a three-year period of time. And Jesus began to reveal who he was and teach what he taught to change the lives of these men who at the very end eventually all abandoned him until the resurrection and until the coming of the Holy Spirit and that they began to follow him. They all gave their lives for him. Every one of them except John died a martyr's death. And you don't die for a lie. You die for truths, right? And so why did he organize it in such a way? And so not only for you, but what about for those people that you interact with, that you care about, that you are mentoring, that you love, that you are praying would come into the kingdom? What about for them? What would you think through first? What's important to know? What's important to wrestle with? And so it seems to me that maybe this gospel can walk us through that. So the first one is this, kingdom values. The Sermon on the Mount, right? And it's the, you build your life on the kingdom. You know, it's interesting in this section, what we call the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus teaches all sorts of stuff. The Beatitudes come first, remember? And I'll just read a few of the Beatitudes. And it says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We usually think those who are confident, those who are strong, those who are in charge. And he goes, no, blessed are those who are uh, have poor in spirit, who understand their brokenness. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are, the poor in sp- uh, blessed are those who mourn, because they'll be comforted. Usually we say, we don't want to mourn. I don't want to feel hurt. I don't want to be sad. But he says, no, blessed are those who, are, who mourn, for they'll be comforted. Blessed are the gentle. Some of your Bibles say the meek. It mean, doesn't mean weak. It means power under control. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Jesus teaches upside down stuff, right? I mean, he talks about the fact that you're salt and you're light. Jesus says he came not to to abolish the law of the Old Testament. He came to fulfill it. He talked about anger and how the anger of man has never accomplished anything of the good of God. He talked about lust and he talked about adultery. He said, you know, that I know that you've heard it said, you that you shouldn't um, commit adultery. But I'll tell you, not only that, but you shouldn't even lust. He began to talk about divorce, and really not about divorce. He talked about the value of marriage, right? He says, this is incredibly powerful. It's the way I designed you. 
Do you know that by 2030, estimated, that 50% of all women will be single and no children? They will have said, I have to accomplish for myself being able to make a living because a man's not going to do it. Because they estimate that by 2050, 25 years from now, that 33% of all working age men will be unemployed because they'll be living off some other person or the government. And they'll have lost motivation to work. And a woman will not trust a man if he can't dig in and be responsible and provide and protect. And they'll have to do it for themselves. You guys, families are going to decrease drastically in years to come. And I'm convinced, as Jesus talks here, that families are so important. It's great satisfaction. Yes, yeah, so challenging. Uh, not my marriage. It's always perfect. But, you know, uh, you guys should be laughing your heads off. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus talked about taking O's. Really what he's talking about is being honest people. He talked about retaliation, that it's really God that you can rely on. He talked about loving your enemies. He said, you've heard it said that you can love those who you love easily and hate your enemies. He says, I'll tell you to love your enemies. Love those who are against you. Giving to the needy. He talked about prayer. He talked about fasting. He talked about being anxious. He talked about judging others. He talked about the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Kingdom values. And look at this. At the very end, he says this. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the, blue, the winds blew and beat on the house, but it did not fall because it was founded on the rock, right? Because those things are going to happen to everybody. The, the rain's going to come, the winds are going to blow, the waves are going to crash in everyone's life. It just is. And you build it on a rock and your house is going to stand. But look at this. And everyone who hears those words of mine and does them will be like a, man, a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell. And here's the, here's the most painful, one of the most painful phrases in the whole, the whole scriptures. It says, and great was its fall. Any life, any family, any country who is built on anything other than the soundness of the teachings of Christ is going to fall. And great is its fall. I am very concerned that our culture and our country is headed in that direction. Until we adopt the values and value what he values. Now, I don't know about you, but you look at this and you think, I don't know about you, but I identify with both sides of wanting to do one, but also having built my life on things that are not sound. And I find myself in need of an answer. Maybe that's why Jesus started with the value system of the kingdom. Maybe he started by saying, here's what's really good and right. And do you recognize that you've fallen short? When we took the Ten Commandments out of schools, we took out a biblical structure for morality. And I think it's probably not served us well. So, but kingdom values comes first. Secondly, kingdom mission. These are the, uh, the, understand the dynamics of mission. He's called us to something, and then he said, I'm going to send you out. Remember, he sent them out two by two, and there was great victory. But he also told them that there's going to be persecution that comes. If I'm going to disciple somebody, I'm going to say, hey, just so you know, it's not all going to be a cakewalk. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be hard. There are going to be great victories, and there's going to be great persecution. People are going to push back. People are going to reject. And it says to, in the scripture to... Stop the, the dust off your feet. That doesn't mean to, to call them you know, all sorts of bad things. But to just know there's going to be opposition and sometimes you need to leave it there and move on to those who might listen, those who might care. And he says in the process of that, don't have any fear. Don't be afraid. Because we want to be afraid. He says, hey, don't be afraid. But I came not with peace, but I came with a sword. I came to divide. That's not something that's very comfortable. We like to think Jesus is the ultimate peacemaker. And in the ultimate he is, but he also comes with a sword because he is going to strike down that which destroys mankind, that which hurts people. He's going to stand up against it. And he says, you guys, there's going to be a reward. 
for those who stand. That's your mission. That's pretty challenging. And it says this. This is a, a passage uh, in uh, chapter 10, verse 40. It says, He who has found his life shall lose it. And he who has lost his life for my sake shall find it. And whoever receives you receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet, because he is a prophet, will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who, re who receives a righteous person, because he is righteous, uh, he is a righteous person, will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water, because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. It says, guys, the mission's going to be hard. You're going to get opposition, but I want you to sacrifice and give to those who are in need. So I want you to follow a value system and understand that you probably messed it up, but I've called you to a mission, and the mission's going to be awesome, but it's going to also be challenging. And the third section of teaching is really what I call, we call kingdom secrets. It's the fact that to engage in the upside-down values and upside-down things of the world, what seems right to the world is not right in God's kingdom, right? He, he gives the, some of these secrets uh, are the sower. And he says that all these, you're going to sow the seed, but it's going to fall on different ground and have different effects. Some of it will just be totally destroyed. Some of it will, will pop up quickly, but it's not going to last. Others, it will last. And he says, but the, there's, a, there's a value to these things. Remember the, the hidden treasure or the pearl of great price, that you'd sell everything for that which is really valuable. You give it all up for a pearl that's so valuable. So what's so valuable but a relationship with God and everything he says? Well, do we tell ourselves that? Do we tell others that? You guys, it's going to be a challenge, but there is such a value in walking with Christ. Then there's this fourth section. Is King, oh, no, let's do the passage here. Uh, all these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing without, without a parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. And Jesus begins to give them these teachings. And they begin to go, wow, that's incredible. But it's upside down from the way we think in this world. Right? And he says, no, these things are true. The next section is this. Uh, is kingdom life. Chapter 18, uh, he begins to talk about what kingdom life is all about. If someone's going to consider being a follower of Jesus, he wants to engage the value system of the kingdom. He wants to talk, understand there's a mission that's going to happen, and it's going to call you into something in your life. And then there's going to be some kingdom secrets to understand, but he's also, he calls us to a kingdom life, and there's a communal piece of that. And he's, and he's beginning to say, uh, there's going to be temptation in the midst of it, but there are lost sheep that you want to go after and care for them, and there's each other. And if a brother sins against you, he's your brother. You know, sometimes um, the Christian world is known sometimes as the most brutal place relationally. And we really hurt each other badly. I have some friends who work in a Christian uh, headquarters and they said I, I couldn't tell you that they were believers because of the way they treat each other that can happen in churches anybody who's ever worked in a church unfortunately you know what I'm talking about they're hard places but look at this passage Peter came up and said to him Lord how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him as many, and he was being generous. He was being so magnanimous. He's like, wow, should I forgive them seven whole times? It's a lot, right? Just think about it. If someone wrongs you, do you want to forgive them seven times? No. And you're like, I'll give you one or two at most. And so Peter's like, he means like big, big hearted here. Seven times? Here's what Jesus says. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times. I'm sure Peter's you know, right on. Just once or twice, what are you going to say, Jesus? And Jesus says to him, but 77 times. Now, there's a difference on what that passage means. Is it 77 or is it 70 times 7? 
It seems in the Greek, probably it means 70 times 7, which is 490 times. So Jesus blows Peter way out of the water. He goes, hey, forgive him 77 times or 70 times or 490 times. What's he saying? Forgive them. It's going to be sacrificial. It's going to be painful. The, the Christian life in the community that Jesus is calling us to is going to require that we be humble and love and forgive and live that life. This is what it means to be a disciple. That there's a value system that we would buy into. That there is a mission that we would be called to. That there are secrets that we need to understand of the depths of the human heart. And there are relationships that are important. Both inside the church and outside of the church, these are incredibly important. And then the last section is about kingdom warnings. And he says in this, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Because what you do is you put, pre you put weights on other people, but you don't do it yourself. And that's going to be the beginning of the end. They're going to lament over Jerusalem and their rejection of the Messiah. And he's going to call us to end times. He says it's all not going to end pretty. It's going to end difficult. There's going to be a great rebellion. There will be a time of tribulation. There will be things that lead up to that. And there will be a huge conflict in the Middle East and around the world. Even this weekend, as you've, read, as you've watched the news, that 300 drones and missiles were fired into, into Israel, which, of which they stopped most. But Iran, for the very first time, has taken direct action in Israel. You guys, I don't know if the end times, if we're in the middle of them. I think it's possible. And that we ought to be ready. Now, I, I'm not a, an alarmist. I'm still going to be living. But you guys, these events, Jesus talked about. And if you're going to be a disciple of Jesus, you have to understand those are coming. There's someone who might be, consider being a disciple, understanding that history has a direction that it is taking. And there is going to be an incredible end to it. And then the Lord's going to come back and take control for a thousand years on earth. That's part of what it means to be a disciple. So you guys, if we look at this, I don't want to spend five years in the book of Matthew. Um, I don't want to spend five years in the book of Matthew and have it just kind of go, well, okay, thank God we're done. <laughs> you know, like, oh my gosh. No, th this was for a purpose. And so as we, as we do this, I want us to say, where do we go with this? Where do we go with this now? If that's what it means to evaluate you yourself as a disciple and others, help them to understand it. Here's what it's going to take. There is a value system to, to wrestle with. There is a mission to consider. There are secrets to learn. There is a life to be lived. And there are warnings because of where this is headed. It may even happen in our lifetime. Wow. What do we do with this? Here's just a couple of thoughts. So, therefore, what now? Being a follower of Christ is never static. It's always dynamic. You may have known Christ for 60 years, but he's called you to a freshness today to continue to learn and be transferred, transformed into his image. Maybe you've just come to Christ recently, and you just know it is going to be a growing experience. He will stretch you and make you new, and it's usually often through difficult things. Isn't it always difficult things? Heavy loads make us stronger. Sometimes we sold the Christian life as, hey, this is going to be a cakewalk. This is going to be smooth. All your troubles go away. And we lied our head off to people. Right? It wasn't true. It's going to be a challenge. But guess what? Life's a challenge for everybody. Right? It's never easy for anybody. And they're going to come, and the winds are going to come, and the rains are going to fly, and the waves are going to crash. They're going to happen. Where are you building your life? It's always going to be dynamic. Next, it is founded on God's grace. It is founded on God's grace. For by grace we have been saved through faith, not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works, that no one should ever boast. It is totally on God's grace. 
his kindness and his love and his mercy, he enjoys pouring out on us. He enjoys loving you. Is that kind of a weird thought? He enjoys loving you. It is on his grace that this is built. And it is grounded on his faithfulness. He will be faithful. He says, I will be with you even to the end of the age. I will be faithful beyond what you've ever imagined. I will show up every day and I will be faithful to you. Wow, that's incredible. You guys, if God's grace and his faithfulness, they invite us to commune with him, right? He says, he says, come. You go, God, I don't deserve it. I know, come, come. I want to be with you. I want you to be with me. I want you to commune. So, so as we do communion here, let me just read this passage. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, and he gave it to the disciples, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying this, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, of the promise, of this new relationship I have created, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And then he said, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day comes when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. That was the last time he ever did communion. He'll do it again when, at, the last, at the wedding supper of the Lamb. He'll do it with us as, a, as entire, all the believers from all of history. He'll do it again. He won't do it until. But he said, do this in remembrance of me. Because I called you to a value system and I know you messed it up but it's still the right value system. I've called you to a mission, to be a part of it, however you can. I've called you to understand the secrets of the kingdom. I've called you to a life of relationships, both with those in the church and around the church and outside of the church. And I've called you because at the end of time, I'm coming back. When the world's falling apart, I'm coming back. And you won't miss it. Because I'll be riding a big white horse and there are going to be a lot of other people with me and I'll have king of kings and lord of lords written on my thighs in blood and I'm coming back to take over. And so he says, you guys, until that time, do this in remembrance of me. So it just seems wholly natural that we would commune with him and we'd come and say, thank you for giving your body for me. Thank you for shedding your blood for me for a whole new relationship built on you. Thank you. And we look forward to you coming back. And we look forward to doing this with you again. But until then, we do this in remembrance of him, right? So here's what I want you to do. If you're serving, I have th three couples who are going to serve communion. If you'd come to your positions. And then as you prepare yourself, just think through, okay, I'm, I'm re-upping my discipleship. I'm re-upping being his person. Or maybe this morning for the very first time, you're giving your life to him. And you say, I'm buying in to the value system. I'm going on mission. I want to understand the secrets of the kingdom. I want to be in relationship with the body of Christ and those around me. And I know you're coming back. And I know that the cross is the only thing that supplies it for me. The cross. Jesus' sacrifice and his resurrection is the only thing. I don't come to Christ with any with any agenda, and I don't have a reference because my references are I am broken and I, am, I don't deserve anything. He says, I know. I choose to give it to you. So as you come, why don't you come and take the elements, take them back to your seat with you, and we'll do communion together, okay? So come as your heart is prepared to one of these three and a half stations, okay? All right.
on that last night of Jesus' life, he gathered his men together in that upper room. They knew something was up, but they weren't quite sure what. But during this Passover dinner, he took the bread and he passed it and they all took a piece. And he says to them very simply, take, eat, this is my body. It's going to be broken for you. I don't know if he looked them all in the eyeball, right, eyeball, 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 but I bet he did. And he scanned the room of all 11 that were still left in the room. And he said, this is for you. And he told them to do this in remembrance of me, but he said it to us now 2,000 years later that he did this for us to give his body because he chose to love us. So take, eat, this is his body broken for you. He then took the cup and he passed it and they all took part. And as he gave it to them, he said, drink it, all of you, for this is the blood of my covenant, this new relationship, this unbreakable relationship that he's created, that nothing would ever get in the way, nothing would ever steal you from the hand of the Father. This is for you. And it's poured out for the forgiveness of sins, of which we have our own, right? And whatever that is on your mind today that has violated who God is, who has violated this value system, and I have a list as long as my arm. He said, this is why I gave my blood, is to forgive that, to set you free, to let you go and to call you to myself. Walk with me, because I am the one who loves you. So let's take and drink his blood, a new covenant. waters your sovereign hand will be my guide but feet may fail and fear surrounds me you never failed and you won't start now and I above the waves when oceans arise my soul will rest in your embrace for I have yours
Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Then lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. And I will call upon your name And keep my eyes above the waves When oceans arise, my soul will rest in your embrace For I am yours And you are couple of last things. I would just want to repeat this. The discipleship, hopefully it's up here. Discipleship is not a program. It is not a product. It is a process of becoming more like Christ. And that's what he has called us to. It is orchestrated by the work of the Holy Spirit. And it utilizes one another as instruments along the way. Right? It is not a product or a, or a program. It is a process of becoming more like him. And it is orchestrated by the work of the Holy Spirit and it utilizes each other in the process. And sometimes it's awesome and fun. And sometimes it's hard. But it is orchestrated by the Holy Spirit. Circle that. You guys, Jesus said, don't go anywhere, guys. After his resurrection, right before his ascension, he said, don't go anywhere because I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. Don't go out and try to do this in your own power, in your own ability. It's going to be a disaster. He says, wait till the Holy Spirit comes, because he will empower you to live this. Now, you're not going to still do it perfectly, but you're going to be growing and allowing the Holy Spirit to do that. And so it seems logical to me that the only thing we would do with the Gospel of Matthew is not do it again, though some of you have asked us to. But let's go on and find the Holy Spirit and how he helps us to live it out in a world that desperately needs it. Okay? So next week we'll start a series on the Holy Spirit. So we'll look forward to seeing you. Love you guys. Take care. Be a disciple.